Hello and uh, welcome everyone. My name is Michael O'Driscoll. I'm a professor in the Department of English and Film Studies here at the University of Alberta. And I'm the director of the Cool Institute for Advanced Study or KIAS. I'm honored to join you today and serve as your host. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. Given that we meet here on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land that we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all Inuit, Métis and First Nations that call this home. I'm very proud that Kias is one of the supporters of the Disrupted Ukrainian Scholars and Students Initiative, or DUS, as we like to call it. DUS came into being less than one month following the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine. And along with our partners, the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, the Cool Folklore Center, and the Worth Institute for Australian and Central European Studies, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as several departments in the Faculty of Arts, we are providing funding and logistical support to disrupted Ukrainian scholars, writists, writers, and artists. In the 22-23 academic year, we provided more than three quarters of a million dollars in support for Ukrainian scholars and students, both here in Edmonton and abroad, including some of those like our guests today who are still in Ukraine. Those dollars have funded travel, living expenses, relocation, conference attendance, and publication subventions, while we also use our logistical and administrative expertise to help sustain scholarly culture by staging research and learning events, uh, encouraging media coverage of the stories of those whose lives have been turned upside down by the horror and tragedy of war, and by personally supporting individuals making some very difficult transitions. Today, we are staging the first in the DUS virtual reading series, and we're very fortunate to feature three creative writers who are joining us live online from Ukraine. We have invited each of them to talk a bit about their literary work and their experiences, as well as to read an excerpt from their work in both Ukrainian and English. I'll introduce each of our guests as we proceed. Our first speaker today, is Lesik Panasiak, a Ukrainian writer, translator, artist, and designer, and a member of PEN Ukraine. He's the author of four personal poetry collections and the co-author of one poetry collection written together with Darina Gladden. His works have been translated into dozens of languages, set to music, used for various plays, po poetry performances, and art exhibitions all over the world. Panasiak is the co-author of a type of short poetic form, Poetry Zook. He is the translator and co-translator of four poetry collections, three literary anthologies, and one libretto. Panasiak is, is a laureate of numerous literary and art contests, a recipient of fellowships awarded by the President of Ukraine, International Writers and Translators House, House of Europe, Steramiski House of Culture, Shevchenko Scientific Society, Dartmouth College, Literary Colloquium Berlin, Penn Ukraine, and Translatorium. And that is a very impressive list of honors and credentials and creative work. I'm very pleased to turn things over to you, Lesik. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, uh, during the residency, I work on a poetry book called Ventriloquist. Uh, in which I uh, explore the essence of humanness and its limitations, uh, challenging the very concepts of borderlines of the human being, uh, from the biological, physiological, anthropological, and philosophical perspectives. Um, the state, uh, as an exclusive barrier of power, uh, perceives and treats humans as a resource, perhaps the most important of resources, but still somehow less as subjects uh, than useful tools to achieve its goals. Uh, people become nameless numbers and statistics in news reports uh, 
white papers and forecasts, uh, losing their humanity uh, in various domains and levels. Uh, the war only intensifies uh, this stance, even further validating it. But uh, for people uh, residing in a country where a war is taking place, uh, the value of the human on the um, contrary increases. Thus, uh, the very concept of human being uh, as used by different uh, entities receives a different meaning, connotation, and purpose. Uh, various approaches, belief systems, and uh, individuals uh, conceptualize humanness uh, differently, depending on the particular qualities they prefer uh, or seek. Uh, there is, for instance, a typical uh, tendency to attempt to rehumanize the human by differentiating people from animals. However, uh, these this, uh, distinctions are usually averaged, situated far from the edges of the human being as truly experienced. They are made without uh, consideration of the extreme situations of life and uh, thus do not probe the borders of the human and the non-human. Uh, I intend in, in my book to expose liminal cases in which these borders are blurred. Uh, then all our uh, previous definitions collapse and we are left speechless, except for the words and the uh, intuitive answers provided us by poetry. Uh, the main topics of the book will be the concept of human, a human body, war, the real world, and the world of dreams, imagination, and death. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to read you uh, some parts from this book. Uh, in original and in my and the Renegladon translation. Нехай пальці сліз, наче серветку зминають ваше обличчя, бо людина померла. Нехай поле вашого обличчя розорюють плуги сліз, бо у вашому сні людина померла. Нехай ваше обличчя заростає прозорим плющем сліз, бо в новинах. Бо у фільмі, бо в театрі, бо у книжці, бо у ваших спогадах, бо у вашій уяві померла людина. Оплакайте людину, першу й останню, рідну й далеку, народжену, клоновану, сконструйовану, вигадану. Примітка. Гирі сліз на вагівницях облич у гастрономі скорботи. Купують і продають. Горя вистачить усім. Купують і продають. Щогодини у світі помирає близько півтисячі людей. Купують і продають. Купують і продають. Let the fingers of tears crumple your face like a napkin because a human has died. Let the ploughs of tears plough your face because in your dream a human has died. Let the transparent ivy of tears grow over your face because in the news, because in a movie, because in a theater, because in a book, because in your memories, because in your imagination a human died. Mourn a human, first and last. Related and unrelated, born, cloned, engineered, fictional. Footnote. Weights of tears on the scales of face in the grocery store of sorrow. Buy and sell. Grief is enough for everyone. Buy and sell. Every hour in the world, about half a thousand people die. Buy and sell. 
buy and sell. У кожній кімнаті замість ікон на стінах висять у золотих рамках визначені людини. У кожній кімнаті замість ікони на стіні висить людина, нерухома, наче зліплена зі слів. На кожній стіні замість фотографії висить людське тіло, наче впольована тварина. Слово «людина» на стінах, наче тіло впольованої тварини. Людина загнана, як дикий звір, у глибоку яму тіла. Людина загнана у глибоку яму слова. Примітка. Будь-яке визначення людини легко заперечити. Людина подібна до значення слова. Усі визначення описують уявну, ідеальну людину, які надають певні властивості і функції залежно від приналежності до певної культури і традицій того, хто формулює. Людина подібна до значення слова. In every room, instead of icons, the definitions of human hang in golden, in golden frames of the walls. In every room, instead of an icon, a motionless human hangs on the wall as if molded from words. On every wall, instead of photograph, a human body hangs like a hunted animal. The body, uh, the word human on the walls is like a body of a hunted animal. Human is driven into a deep pit of the body like a wild animal. Human is driven into a deep pit of word. Footnote. Any definition of human is easy to debunk. A person is similar to the meaning of the word. All definition describe an imaginary ideal human who is assigned certain properties and fictions depending on belonging to a certain culture and tra traditions of the one who formulates the definition. Person is similar to the meaning of the word. Людина як невидимий вершник тіла. Тіло як вершник на невидимому коні людини. Тіло, що живе у світі тварин і змушує думати як тварина, змушує бути твариною. Тваринні інстинкти тіла, тваринні бажання тіла, імпульси, гормони, ДНК. Тіло тварина, тіло хижак, тіло жертва. Тіло завод смерті, тіло завод життя. Тіло, що виконує норму виготовлення деталей життя і смерті. Тіло, що горчить і показує зуби, наче верстат на заводі. У нестямі зуби вгризаються у слово «людяність». Примітка. Бути людиною – це лише наслідок традицій попередніх поколінь людей, проти людей і тих, хто бу були до них. Ця наша фізіологія – лише наслідок традицій. Мислення поза реальним світом – лише наслідок традицій. Наші традиції ведуть нас до існування поза тілом. Human as an invisible rider of the body, a body as a rider on an invisible human horse, a body that lives in the animal world and makes you think like an animal, makes you be an animal. Animal instincts of the body, animal desires of the body, impulses, hormones, DNA. Body animal, body predator, body victim. Body factory of death, body factory of life. Body that fulfills the norm of manufacturing parts of life and death. Body that growls and shows its teeth like a machine in a factory. In frustration, teeth bite into the word humanity. Footnote. Being human is only a consequence of the traditions of previous generations of people, proto-humans and those who came before them. All our physiology is only a consequence of traditions.
thinking outside the real world is only a consequence of traditions. Our traditions lead us to exist outside the body. Людське тіло, як оксамитовий костюм у театрі ляльок, уживає щойно продзвенить дзвінок. Оксамитовий костюм людського тіла уживає щойно продзвенить будильник. Встановлення будильника людського тіла з кістками замість дзвінка. Заведення годинника людського тіла з кістками замість стрілок. Мітотичний поділ згоди як перший цок годинника людського тіла. Чи існує час поза годинником? Примітка. Формування людського тіла починається із заплідання яйцеклітини, тобто утворення зиготи розміром настільки крихітним, що неозброєному оком її неможливо побачити. Ця непомітна дрібничка комусь може нагадувати людину. A human body as velvet suit in a puppet theater comes to life as soon as the bell rings. Velvet suit of a human body comes to life as soon as the alarm goes off. Setting alarm clock of the human body with bones instead of bell. Setting clocks of the human body with bone instead of pants of clock. Methodic division of zygote as the first tick of a human body clock. Does time exist outside a clock? Footnote. A human body begins with a fertilized egg forming a zygote so tiny it is invisible to the naked eye. This inconspicuous incons- little thing to someone may seem human. Людина зі штучним серцем у грудях кохає всім серцем. Людина зі штучними легенями дихає на повні груди. Війна у грудях качає кров до всіх органів тіла. Війна викачує кров зі всіх регіонів, наче нафту. Людина біжить маратон із біговими протезами. Людина обіймає родину біонічними протезами. Людина з війною замість кінцівок. Втрачені кінцівки болять, наче війна. Втрачені люди болять, наче війна. Примітка. Людина зі штучними органами, людина з протезами залишається людиною. Який відсоток власного тіла можна втратити і залишитись людиною? Чи визначає тіло людину? Human with an artificial heart in their chest loves with all their heart. Human with artificial lungs breathes deeply. War in chest pumps blood to all parts of the body. War pumps blood from all regions like oil. Human runs a marathon with running pro- prosthetic legs. Human hugs family with bionic prosthetic arms. Human with war instead of limbs. Lost limbs heart like war. Lost people heart like war. Footnote. Human with artificial organs, human with prost- prosthesis remains human. That percentage, what percentage of body can someone lose and remain human? Does body define human? Uh, that's all, but I should say that uh, there are currently no people with artificial lungs, but recently where was a successful operation to implant artificial lungs in a peak. Uh, therefore, I believe that a similar procedure could be applied to humans soon. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. That was incredibly moving and, and really wonderful. I'm sure um, that our audience members will, will have questions for you. Um, I'll remind everyone, we're going to ask each of our speakers to uh, share with us, and then we'll open things up to questions. If you have questions for any of the panelists, uh, we're inviting you to uh, please uh, put those in the chat, and we will uh, share those with the panelists for discussion. Um, I'd like to introduce next Yulia 
Ilyuka, uh, who is a poet, prose writer, journalist, and columnist, uh, who was born in 1982 in Karviska Oblast, Ukraine. She is the author of several books for adults and children. Her poems and prose stories have been translated into English, German, Italian, Bulgarian, Hungarian, Catalan, Polish, Swedish, and Portuguese. Her works have appeared in magazines and newspapers of Ukraine, Austria, Poland, Bulgaria, Hungary, Spain, UK, Sweden, USA, Italy, and Portugal. Ilyuka has received a number of awards, including the Ols Hanchar International Ukrainian German Literary Prize, uh, the International Literary Contest Word Coronation 2018 Prize, and the Small Upskick Skip Prize as well, too. We're very honored to have you join us here today, Yulia, and I'll turn things over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to thank for the scholarship uh, support for, of my project and uh, the opportunity to share it with the audience. And uh, I also would like uh, to add a few words about me. Originally, I'm from Kharkiv, the second largest city in Ukraine, and the distance from Kharkiv to the Russian border is only about 40 kilometers. I write poetry and uh, prose for adults and uh, prose for children. Uh, for adults, I write mostly about war because uh, since uh, 2014, I have been helping uh, the Ukrainian armed forces as a volunteer and uh, together with my friends, we uh, collected uh, tactical aid kits for soldiers and uh, and in uh, at least uh, three cases, uh, they saved lives. And uh, this is something I can be proud of, really. Uh, also, I have been a creator of the socio-poetic uh, multimedia project, The Mark of Home, which is uh, dedicated to the rehabilitation of uh, war veterans in uh, Ukraine through creativity. Uh, also, I have a son, he's uh, 11 years old, uh, so I write uh, children's uh, books for him, and uh, he's uh, my first uh, reader and uh, critic, and uh, he's a big fan of cats. And uh, I uh, wrote uh, several uh, books about cats for him, uh, like uh, Cosmo Cats, Aero Cats, and uh, I... Uh, I'm going to continue. But uh, today I uh, would like to talk about a project I worked on uh, last year. It's called uh, My Women, and it's about the experience of uh, Ukrainian uh, women during the war. It is a collection of short fiction, and uh, this collection includes 40 individual stories of women whose uh, lives were changed by the war. Each of uh, these stories begins with the words a woman who and uh, has no title. Uh, the aim of the project is to show the war in Ukraine through the eyes of uh, different women. Uh, these are short stories about how Ukrainian women of different ages, different uh, social statuses and uh, different destinies who woke up to the sound of explosions on that February morning and uh, realized that war had broken out, are experiencing this war, surviving in it, living it. These are stories about loss, about pain, about loneliness, about sacrifice, about revenge, about love, about hope, or about our life. The heroines are ordinary Ukrainian women in whom readers can recognize themselves, their relatives, their friends, their neighbors, their colleagues, and etc. They have no names, they are all just women. These stories are faceless and at the same time they are very personal, so these nameless women seem to tell the story of every Ukrainian woman who was affected by the war. 
And for the next uh, few minutes, I'm going to read uh, several of these stories in uh, Ukrainian and in English. Жінка, яка зранку вибігла з дому в супермаркет по молоко, більше не мала куди повертатися. Коли вона вийшла за тебе, земля здригнулася. Жінка важко впала на тротуар, роздавивши пакет з молоком і булочку до кави. Зверху на неї посипалося скло, і жінка рефлекторно прикрила голову руками, не відчуваючи, як у шкіру впиваються дрібні уламки. Вила сирена, криком заходилися сигналки автівок. Кров крапала на скроню і текла по щоці. Розливалось молоко з-під поли пальта. Жінка вичекала кілька хвилин і побігла. Попереду димів її будинок. Вона мчала до нього, наче могла його врятувати. Кров текла по обличчю, кров шуміла в голові. Коли вона майже досягла цілі, її перехопив чоловік у чорному одязі. Жінка спробувала вирватися, але він міцно обхопив її руками. «Хто там у вас?» – крикнув прямо у вухо. Жінка раптом обм'якла, обвисла в руках чорного незнайомого чоловіка, і він не втримав її, і вони разом повалилися на землю. «Нікого!» – прошепотіла жінка, розмазуючи кров по губах. «У мене там нікого!» Уперше в житті самотня жінка зраділа, що в неї не було нікого. A woman who ran out of her house to get milk at the supermarket no longer had a home to return to. Leaving the ATB supermarket, she felt the earth shaking. She was knocked down on the ground, squashing a carton of milk and a bun to go with her coffee. Broken glass rained down of her and she instinctively covered her head with her hands not feeling tiny shards cut through her skin. The air raid siren was blaring, car horns screaming. Blood dripped on her temple and trickled down her neck. A pool of milk spread from under her cord. The woman waited for a few minutes, then jumped to her feet and started running. Smoke was rising above her apartment block. She ran toward to it fast as if she could rescue it. Blood was streaming down her face. Blood was rushing in her ears. She had almost reached her destination when a man in black stopped her. The woman tried to break free, but he wrapped his arms tightly around her. Do you have someone there? He shouted into her ear. The woman suddenly went all limp, her body sagging in the arms of the stranger in black. He could not hold her upright and they both collapsed on the ground. I don't, the woman whispered, blood smeared on her lips. I don't have anyone there. For the first time in her life, the lonely woman was glad she had no one. And uh, actually, I uh, forgot it to add that uh, translation uh, was made by Hanna Lelib, and I am very thankful to her for it. And the second story. Жінка, яка поховала сина на городі, поставила йому хрест із двох скріплених дротом соснових дощок. Дошки купив син, щоб навесні зробити ремонт у хаті, але почалася війна, і весна настала не для всіх. Син помер миттєво, жінка навіть не встигла нічого зрозуміти. Перші два снаряди лягли десь далеко, а осколок третього скоцив сина, коли вони перебігали з літньої кухні в погріб. Жінка впала поруч з ним. Вона навіть не могла кричати, тільки стогнала, наче це її поранило, і шкрибла нігтями мерзлу землю. Коли вибухи віддалились, вона, важко обіпершись на руки, стала на коліна, глянула на сина. 
У нього не було пів голови. Жінка відповзла під стіну кухні, притулилася до неї спиною і почала битися головою, яка в неї ще була, об цеглу. Вона не плакала, тільки хрипіла і стогнала. Хустка сповзла, і скоро її сиве волосся зафарбувалося кров'ю. Сусідка, яка прошкандибала через півгодини, вирішила, що жінку поранено в голову. Поховати сина жінка змогла, коли розмерзлася земля. Неглибоку яму копала кілька днів. Тіло загорнула в плівку, яку син купив для парника. Син був атеїстом, але вона все одно зробила йому хрест, поздиравши шкіру на пальцях товстим негнучким дротом. Ним же прикрутила я ржаву металеву пластину, на якій крейдою написала ім'я, прізвище, по батькові, дату народження і дату смерті. Уночі в погребі жінки заболіло серце. На ранок вона не вийшла. За кілька днів дощ змив напис. Хрест залишився стояти безіменним. A woman who buried her son on the vegetable patch made a cross for him from two pine planks bound together with wire. Her son bought those planks to fix their house up in spring. But the war broke out and for some people spring never arrived. Her son died instantly. The woman could barely register that. The first two shells fell somewhere further away, but a fragment of the third one killed her son when they were running from the summer kitchen toward the cellar. The woman collapsed next to him. She could not even scream. She only groaned as if it was her who was wounded and scratched the frozen ground with her nails. When the sounds of explosions grew distant, she rose to her knees, leaning heavily on her arms. She looked at her son. Half of his head was missing. The woman crawled toward the kitchen wall and, pressing her back to it, started to bang her head yet intact against the bricks. She was not crying. She was only gasping and groaning. Her headscarf slipped off and her white hair was soon dyed with blood. A neighbor who shuffled into her yard half an hour later thought she'd suffered a head injury. The woman could bury her son only after the ground soared. It took her a few days to dig a grave which was not even that deep. She wrapped his body into a film her son had bought to cover the greenhouse. He was an atheist, but she made a cross for him. Anyway, a thick, stiff wire ripping the skin off her fingers. She used the same wire to attach a rusty metal plate to the cross where she wrote her son's name and dates of birth and death with a piece of chalk. The woman was spending the night in the cellar when she felt a pain in her chest. She did not walk out in the morning. Several days later, the rain washed away the inscription on the plate. The cross was left standing nameless. Thanks, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Yulia. As very wonderful of you to share that work with us and uh, and what a what an intriguing project that is indeed and an important one as well too. Uh, our next guest is Andre Bodarenko. Uh, Andre is a playwright, cultural researcher, doctor of philosophy, uh, the, a participant in the worldwide Ukrainian play readings project, and the co-founder of the Theater of Playwrights. <clears throat> he is the author of numerous plays shortlisted at major Ukrainian drama festivals and presented in many European cities. Some of his productions include Ghostland, presented in Santa Monica in 2023, What You Can Hear in the Darkness, uh, presented in Seftenberg, uh, Germany in 2023, uh, Livia uh, Tango, presented in Livia in 2023, Survivor Syndrome, presented in Lutsk, 
in 2022. Fox Dark as the Light Night, uh, which was one of a two-part production entitled The Light from Below, Stories from Ukrainian Basements, uh, presented at Barons Court Theatre in London in the UK in 2022. And uh, my favorite title, uh, Asshole, presented at Golden Gate Theatre in Kyiv uh, in Ukraine in 2020. Uh, Bodorenko's texts have been published in several Ukrainian and foreign anthologies, and the English translation of the play Ghostland was published as a separate edition uh, by uh, the U.S. A publishing house Laertes in 2023. Uh, Andre, thank you so much for joining us today. Please uh, take the stage. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you, Michael, for presenting me. And uh, uh, I should say that uh, this possibility of uh, professional writing uh, nowadays uh, being in Ukraine, it's very important for, I think, for every writer and for playwright also. So a big, big thanks for this opportunity for all of us. It really means for us, it, it really supports us and uh, shows that we are not alone and we can uh, work. We can uh, still uh, tell stories about Ukraine, about us. And, uh, well, uh, before this uh, full-scale uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine, uh, I was a playwright who was writing uh, about uh, uh, different topics. Among them, it was also the war uh, in the east of Ukraine, uh, for example, uh, the topic of refugees uh, who were dis displaced people who were uh, resettled, uh, forcing to resettle from east of Ukraine to other cities. Uh, and uh, also the the, the topic of uh, what, uh, how the war, uh, this uh, war that continued from for many years, how it uh, influenced uh, the, the Ukraine. But now I, I am just a war player, right? <laughs> I, I could say. Uh, for last uh, two years, I was, all my plays were only about the war. And uh, uh, this play I am working now uh, as a part of this uh, residence, virtual residence. It's not directly uh, connected to the topic of the war. Uh, it's a play that is based on the diaries of my mother, uh, who was writing it uh, during the 60s and uh, 70s and 80s years uh, during her life. Uh, and uh, I discovered this diaries only after my mother's my mother's death in uh, four years ago. I didn't know that she was doing it, and uh, uh, and then I I found them. And uh, sure, it's like very uh, personal material for me, uh, but also it's uh, of course it is connected to to this war. Uh, it's connected to this, uh, like, cultural, historical dimensions of this war. And uh, the stories that I read in these diaries, they told me the story of uh, uh, my mother. She, she was like a Ukrainian girl uh, who was born in a uh, Ukrainian village in the north part, part of Ukraine and uh, under the influence of uh, big state uh, Soviet propaganda. She uh, went to a big uh, construction process in Kazakhstan. She wanted to be part of this uh, big socialist uh, building uh, uh, that uh, was underway after the war. And uh, so, so I could see this uh, development from uh, from wanting to really. A real wish to become this model Soviet uh, young uh, person, young girl, uh, and uh, how it, she was slowly, gradually disappointing uh, all this reality. And also we, we can see this internal, uh, very radical contradictions between the Soviet propaganda, Soviet ideology, and the Soviet realities of uh, everyday life. 
so uh, at first uh, my mother like wanted to overcome this contradiction uh, with by herself and to 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 become this way of uh, solving these contradictions but of course we we can see now that this contradictions was like very uh, principle very radical uh, they couldn't be overcome and so we we can see how this uh, state with this ideology used her and all other people and uh, like and the enthusiasm that they were uh, spending on this construction uh, working for for almost for nothing <laughs> and so on and uh, and, and and also it's a story of uh, finding of looking for some other ways uh, how to perceive uh, as herself uh, when this uh, ideology is not working and uh, what is the way to be now uh, and so she was looking back at her uh, own uh, family history at her uh, her own uh, like native land where she is from her native village and how uh, she turned uh, to this uh, old time uh, from for this region where she belonged, but she was taken from. Uh, well, uh, there is uh, different topics that uh, I, I want to explore. I want to research with with, with this play, but uh, the, the main is uh, that uh, almost uh, all life, my mother was a Soviet. Uh, person, Soviet people, uh, but still uh, now uh, I would like to to put her out of this only Soviet history and to recreate her, his, her story as also uh, a story of human, a story of Ukrainian girl who uh, wanted to become a model Soviet person and so on. I want to, uh, to this story to retell so that uh, uh, recapture my mother from this uh, pure uh, Soviet past and to to bring some other dimensions uh, to to make sense of her life not only in this uh, Soviet terms and Soviet notions as they were thinking uh, they were living in but to to like well to to recapture <laughs> my, my mother's life from and uh, it's a uh, strongly connected to this war because uh, the Soviet past it was used as a tool of war as a weapon and so we must uh, we must somehow uh, to transform uh, this uh, to, to to make our own statement about all this to 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 speak with our own voice what we think how we perceived it what we think it was and uh, well, uh, this story, this topic is uh, concerns not only, uh, of course, not only my mother, but uh, the whole generation of our parents uh, that were Soviet people, but still uh, not only Soviet people and, and, and so on. This story is much more complicated that we are now uh, used to think. So uh, that's like a big uh, task for me and it's, it's a big challenge. And uh, I was whole not hoping <laughs> i was uh, expecting this uh, this winter uh, the russian strikes also would uh, make uh, this electricity cuts as last year but still we uh, and, and and i thought that i would be reading these diaries uh, with the light uh, of the candles <laughs> and would be immersing myself into this past reality uh, but there was uh, still no electricity cuts so i was able to reread them uh, under the electrical light, <clears throat> uh, as far as as now, <laughs> Let, let's see. Uh, and so, uh, I still I still don't uh, quite uh, see uh, what would be my artistic approach. I still I'm considering different options. Uh, so, and it's still uh, I'm still working on the general concept how i would present the story what would be the the main idea so uh, i would uh, now would better continue with the reading uh, excerpts 
from 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 the diaries. And I uh, <clears throat> I don't know if there would be time enough to read all materials that I prepared, but uh, let's see. Друге грудня. Сьогодні неділя. Цілий день просиділа на ліжку. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, okay. uh, я забув сказати рік. Uh, це грудень 1962 року. Сьогодні неділя. Цілий день просиділа на, на ліжку. Тільки до магазину сходила. День пройшов без сліду, ніби його й не було. Прочитала дві книги, наривілася гарненько і ось сіла писати. Все про те саме. Життя одноманітне до неможливості. Що буде далі? Потрібно щось міняти, щось робити інакше, перестати хандрити. Ось так завжди. Я тільки думаю про те, щоб щось змінити, а насправді не так все виходить. Причин багато. Одна з них – матеріальна залежність. Ну хто вигадав ці гроші? Іноді все найкраще, чого прагнеш, недосяжне тільки через них. Ось е, лишилося 50 копійок. Гроші отримую лише 10 числа. А що робити? Адже ні в кіно, ні на ковзику, ні на ковзинку не сунеться. Та й одягаюся так, що соромно кудись піти. Ось і сиди тільки на ліжку і нікуди не лізь. Як це важко усвідомлювати своє безсилля. Але нічого. Адже те, це становище тимчасове і воно скоро зміниться. Треба тільки вірити і не зневірятися. Адже не все в житті не гладко, не рівностей багато. Ось уже незабаром 1963 рік. Як я зустріну його? Боже, хоч би з кимось побачитись, побалакати, побажати щиро щастя. Хочеться чогось особливого, незрозумілого, чогось такого, як у нікого. 2 січня 1963 року. Ось і ще один рік прожито. Через 4 місяці тобі буде вже 18. Так багато, але водночас і мало. Сиджу вдома, у мене ще відгули. Завтра вже треба йти на роботу, а так не хочеться. Набридає, та й важко все-таки. І вже немає того вогника, з яким я працювала раніше. Згас він і залишився тільки димок розчарування. Вогнику не вистачило їжі, в атмосфері дуже багато вогицю, що не підтримує горіння. Ось так, напевно, і божеволять люди. Що робити? Де знайти правду? Взагалі, як правильно зробити життя в майбутньому без помилок? Я не знаю, не можна лишатись тут, на цій будові серед цих варварів. Чи можна пролежати на ліжку цілий день, чи ні? Якби був такий вид змагань, я б, напевно, посіла б перше місце. Як життя? Ось лежала, читала і думала, шаленіла. Щось мені потрібно, а що? Чи є кохання на світі? Читала драми Генріка Іпсона. Він багато пише про мету життя, про кохання піднесеного, чистого, прекрасного, закликає до чесності людських відносин, до поваги. Але рідко люди чесні справжні перемагають. Майже в кожній драмі ці люди гинуть, чи самогубство, чи їх вбивають. Я думаю, зараз це становище мало чим відрізняється від написаного. Взагалі у світі так багато підлостей і прихованих, та відкритих. І щоб їх знищити, потрібно багато сил. Пустили якусь чутку, що дівчат братимуть до армії. Було б непогано, прямо цікаво. 4 січня. Ось я сьогодні весь день ходила весела. Чому? Сказати не можу. Просто так, від почуття життя, від морозного ранку, яке зарядило бадьорістю на весь день, від свідомості своєї корисності. На будівельному майданчику охоплює якесь дивне почуття. Ось людина на вигляд ніби нікчема перед цими величезними панелями, блоками, кранами, що зводяться, будинками. Але вона все-таки... Ця людина – невеликий господар усього. Все велике їй підкоряється, їй маленькі, але розумні істоті здатні мислити. У нас в кімнаті в гуртожитку двоє хворих, напевно, грипом. Ми з Ніною так багато сміялися з Зоєю, якій все було холодно, і ми всі свої ковдри і навіть матраци поклали на неї. Людині дано велике багатство сміх. Сміх – це теж свого роду друг, вірний друг. Я ще не зустрічала людей старшого покоління, окрім Шуриної мами, які б судили про життя хоч трохи по-нашому. От взяти нашого Кузьмича, бригадира. З першого погляду він мені сподобався та навіть чимось зацікавив. Мені здалося, що він досвідчений маляр, який знає, любить прямо закоханою цю професію, добре ставиться до молоді, вчить її і чесний у всьому. А насправді він трохи не такий. Найбільше мені в ньому не подобається велика, навіть величезна спрага до наживи, грошей. Заради грошей він готовий на все. Я розумію, заробіток теж важливий, але ж не можна підкоряти цьому все життя, прагнення. Гроші – це те, чого найбільше не люблю. Але вони грають, і це найгірше не останню роль в житті. Скоріше б перестали оплачувати працю грошима, а щоб працювали просто так, за дякую, за повагу. Тоді б праця була б краща, красивіша, піднесеніша. Хоча б були б і погані випадки, але я гадаю тільки спочатку. 
щоб гарно і добре трудитися, кожен хотів би так, як хочуть зараз гарно і добре вдягатися. І наступний уривок, це вже 79-го року, 13 червня. Їздила в суботу в своє село, вилідники видвозила Олега, свого сина. Дуже мені там подобається. Чудове повітря, гарні картини краєвиду, рідні місця, збудували новий магазин двоповерховий. Добре, ні метуші, ні галасу. Допомогла мамі підгортати картоплю. І з задоволенням залишилася там назавжди. Жаль, дуже батьків залишились одні безпорадні старі хворі. Навіщо було ростити нас і давати нам сили здоров'я, щоб зараз залишатися на самоті без підтримки до допомоги? Все частіше повертаюся до думки, а може б треба було все залишити і поїхати з дітьми в село. За всіма законами моралі та людяності, так мені б і слід було вчинити. Окей, uh, okay. and now uh, in English, uh, this uh, diary I will start from uh, 1962. Uh, the, my mother is uh, telling about her life in a dormitory uh, where on the construction site where she was working as a whitewasher. She was uh, 17, then, uh, 17, 18. December 2nd. Today is Sunday. I sat on the bed all day. I just went to the shop. The day passed without a trace, as if he had never existed. I read two books, cried a lot, and then sat down to write. It's all about the same thing. Life is monotonous to the point of impossibility. What's next? You need to change something, do something differently, but don't move. This is how it is. I always just think about changing something, but in reality it doesn't work out the, that way. There are many reasons. One of them is material dependence. Well, who invented the money? Sometimes all the best things you strive for are unattainable only because of them. There are only 50 kopecks le left, and it's only the 10th of December when I will get the money. What should I do? I cannot go anywhere to the cinema, skating, unique nowhere. And I dress in a such a way that I'm embarrassed to go out. So just sit on the bed and don't poke your nose anywhere. How hard it is to realize your powerlessness. But okay, after all, the situation is temporary and it will change soon. Just need to believe and not despair. After all, not everything in life goes smoothly. There are a lot of irregularities. January 2nd, 1963. Here's already another year. In four months, you will already be 18. So much, but at the same time, not enough. I'm sitting at home. I still have time off. Tomorrow I have to go to work, but I don't want to. It gets boring and it's very hard. And I no longer have that spark with which I worked before. It went out and only a haze of disappointment remained. The fire don't have enough food. There is a lot of carbon in the atmosphere that doesn't support combustion. This is probably how people go crazy. What to do? Where can I find the truth? In general, how to make life in the future correctly without mistakes. I know I can stay here in the construction department among these barbarians. January 2nd. Is it possible to lie on the bed all day or not? If there was this type of competition, I would probably take first place. Oh, life. There I was laying, reading, thinking, and getting mad. I need something, but what? Is there a love in the world? I read Henrik Ibsen's uh, dramas. He writes a lot about the purpose of life, about sublime, pure, beautiful love, calls for honesty in human relationships, for respect, But rarely do honest and real people win. In almost every drama, these people die or commit suicide or are killed. And I think that at present, this position is not much different from what was written. In general, there are so many meaning meannesses in the world, both hidden and open. They started some rumors that the girls would be drafted into the army. It would be nice. It's really interesting. Fourth January. I was happy all day today. Why, I can say, just like that, from the feeling of life, from the frosty morning which charged me with vigor for the whole day, from the consciousness of my use, usefulness. There is a strange feeling at the construction site. Here is a man who looks like insignificant nothing in front of these huge panels and blocks, cranes, buildings that are being erected. But man is still 
a small master of everything. Everything big is subordinate to him. A small but, but intelligent creature capable of thinking. There are two sick people in our room, probably the flu. Nina and I laughed so much with Zoe, who was still cold, and we put all our blankets and even mattresses on her. Human being has been given great wealth, laughter. Laughter is also a kind of friend, a faithful one. I haven't yet met people of the older generation, except for Shurka's mothers who would judge life at least a little in our way. Take our Kuzmich, the foreman. At first glance, I liked him and even became interested in him. It seems, it seemed to me that he is an experienced whitewasher, knowledgeable and loving, truly in love with his profession, and is honest in everything. In fact, in fact, he's little different. What I don't like most about him is his great, even enormous thirst for profit, for money. He's ready to do anything for money. I understand earnings are also very important, but you can't subordinate your whole life and aspirations to this. Money is what I dislike most. But they play an important role in life. I wish that they would stop paying for work with money and everybody would rather work just like that for thank you, for respect. Then the work would be better, more beautiful and sublime. Also, there would be bad cases, but I think only first. Everyone would like to work beautifully and well, just as they now want to dress beautifully and well. Well, I don't know if I have time enough to read the, what I intended. Do, do I have still several minutes? Uh, thank you for for checking in, Andre. Um, I think if it's okay, we will go if we'll go a little bit over time, just so that we can give you time to 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 perhaps read one more excerpt. And uh, if it's all right with with our panelists, uh, maybe just address a question or two before we finish up. So if you if you have another brief ex excerpt you'd like to share with us, you're welcome to do so. Okay, one or two minutes then, and it will be the end. Okay, thank you. Because uh, I, I read uh, the excerpt from the uh, 1963, and now I will uh, skip to the 1979. And, uh, there is uh, like a change in mood and everything. Okay, uh, 1979, June 7th, June 7. I went to my village, Velidniki, uh, on Saturday and took Oleg, my son, with, with me. I really like it there, wonderful air, beautiful landscape views, native places. They built a new store, there are two floors. Okay, no fuss, no noise. Helped my mother to treat potatoes in the field. I would happily stay there forever. I feel very sorry for the parents. They were left alone, helpless, old, sick. Why was it necessary to raise us, give us strength and health, only to now be left alone without support and help? More and more often... I return to the thought that maybe I need to leave everything here and go with the children to the village. All the same, there won't be a good life for me here, but at least your heart is in the right place <clears throat> and with your parents is calm and bad. According to all the laws of morality and humanity, this is what I should, should have done. June 15, rain on the street, I sit and think about life. It was in vain, of course, very in vain that I left my native village for good. It was necessary to live for a while and then return with the teacher's diploma, for example. And live among cloudy native places, paths, trees, and with parents protecting their old age. I think all the time about how to continue with them. It is impossible, absolutely impossible, to leave them alone for a long time. The idea arose to become a home worker. Then it would be possible to go to them more often, and it would be easier for me to run the household and would be better for the children. I found everything and tried to implement it, Maybe it will be better. Okay, uh, that's uh, all for me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for sharing the beautiful words of your very articulate and reflective uh, mother. It's such a wonderful, wonderful thing to share with us. Um, we do have uh, a, a couple of questions and uh, that have been shared, and and I thought I'd begin with one um, that's directed to all of the panelists, um, and. Uh, uh, Andrea, Andrea Kopelik writes, your poetry stories and writing is so powerful and moving. Thank you for sharing such personal glimpses into your everyday lives. As the war continues, what gives you hope and what do you see for Ukraine's future? Would anybody like to talk a little bit about what gives you hope and what, what your expectations are? Yeah. 
Okay, maybe I will I will I will start <laughs> to answer this. My mic is still on, so uh, the, the main thing about hope is uh, to to feel that we are not alone. I, I I felt it in the beginning of this full scale invasion when there was a time when I I was thinking that we are left that uh, the world is just watching and doing nothing, and it, we are so were so helpless, and it was very bad feeling that uh, like was eating you and uh, depriving you all all strengths. But uh, then slowly when uh, there was demand for, for example, for, for our text to be written and uh, for our voices to be heard. And uh, I, I just felt that uh, we, we are not alone. And that, that's what gave me the, 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 big, the biggest strength to be, to feel hope in this first months. So I think it, it it's very important. Thank you, Andre. Yulia, would do you have anything to say in response to that? Uh, actually, it can sound uh, strange, but uh, hate to our enemies is uh, that thing that uh, give gives me hope now and. Uh, uh, also the faith in our victory because if uh, if we lose we we have no future thank you Yulia. Lasik, how about yourself uh i think uh, that the main thing that uh, gives me hope is uh people uh ukrainian people and people abroad who uh, support us who uh, speak with us um also mm, warriors who mm, come back from the front and uh uh, who lost their limbs but still have smiles on their faces and uh, who still believe in life, uh, in happiness. Uh, so I don't think we... I think that they should do the same. So, like, the, the main thing is uh, people. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, we're receiving a number of expressions of, of gratitude and uh, thoughtfulness from, from the folks who are in the audience today. Um, and uh, a couple of questions have returned to um, ideas about um, ways in what challenges you are each facing in terms of uh, your ability to reach audiences with your work at this point in time. I, I in particular have been wondering about how the cultural infrastructure that you depend on as authors have uh, been has been disrupted and what sort of needs you see in your creative communities. We're very happy pleased and proud to be able to to support you as writers in the hope that you can continue to produce your work um, but uh, there's some interest in in how uh, communicating with the world with your audiences um, has been disrupted and and how uh, your allies across the globe can support you in that I remember we will start again <laughs> answering to this question. Uh, well, paradoxically, with this full scale invasion, there uh, were game changes uh, in uh, perception of Ukrainian culture. Uh, before that, uh, it was like we were not very interesting for the foreign audience, uh, for the global audience. But with this uh, big war, uh, we now uh, like uh, we we felt that we are in uh, like we have attention and we need to use this opportunity 
and uh, so uh, there was uh, many uh, invitations uh, and many people reacting and uh, my, uh, i personally made uh, many travels and uh, met many people and i established many connections that uh, we want to uh, to strengths uh, now and uh, for example uh, was if you are talking about uh, how to uh, help our creative community uh, with the help of that connection uh, now we are uh, if you're talking about player rights community in Ukraine uh, we are implementing a project uh, that was uh, we, we received the grant uh, for this together with uh, foreign uh, partners uh, we are like building this uh, connections between uh, Ukrainian player rights and uh, uh, foreign colleagues and uh, building this network of uh, sharing of uh, knowledge and uh, expertise and uh, experience and everything. Uh, I, I mean, it, it all begins with this uh, after the second uh, 2000. Uh, uh, well, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. I forget the word. Uh, I mean, with uh, this uh, full scale invasion. Uh, so uh, there, there, there are many opportunities now, and we uh, really grateful for them. But the main challenge is that, uh, despite all this, that world is open now for us. So the world is ready to listen for our own voice, not through the Russian voice that it was before, but in our own voice. But still, it's a big challenge to explain uh, to people who are living not in West countries. Why we think that Russia is so great evil that we don't believe that uh, something good will co ever come from it. Well, we don't want to uh, establish some dialogue with Russian people. Why we don't want to uh, to hope that Russia uh, will change uh, for better and we should uh, support the good Rus so-called good Russians. It's a very big problem to explain uh, what we feel and what we think about uh, this problem i mean this uh, perception of russia as some cultural uh, good country that uh, for some reason has a bad dictator uh, who uh, forces uh, who th who forces the people of russia to start the war but we know that it's not only putin it's also uh, the, the Russians are really hating Ukrainians, uh, just average Russians. It's zero also. So uh, it's the uh, most difficult part of our uh, task. Thank you. Thank you, Andrei. Lasik, do you have anything to add? Uh, I think Andrei said the right words. Uh, mm, I think... Uh, I I can't add something something else. Thank you, Yulia. Anything to add to that? I would like uh, to add uh, that, uh, in uh, my opinion, uh, our main goal, uh, the main goal of uh, Ukrainian uh, literature now. Uh, is uh, to to give uh, voices uh, that uh, Ukrainian writers who are on the front line now because uh, they uh, really have powerful voices and uh, they uh, deserve it. They deserve to be heard uh, all over the world. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have gone now 10 minutes over time and, and out of respect for our audience members and our panelists, um, we should bring things to a close. There are questions we didn't get to, uh, which are a demonstration of, of how uh, much uh, thought you've provoked with your audience today and uh, how meaningful this is to everyone involved. So for our audience members who posed questions that we weren't able to introduce into the conversation, my apologies. I. I do want to say um, that um, we hope that um, this is a small demonstration of uh, the care and, and the love and, and the thought that is coming to all of you um, from 
um, all around the world, and particularly here from uh, Edmonton, Alberta, uh, we are where we are home to uh, the largest population of, of Ukrainians outside of Ukraine, um, and where there is a community of people who are eager to support you and to show that support. And uh, we're very uh, uh, fortunate to be in a position where we can we can help to make that happen. Uh, we hope that this is just the beginning of an ongoing relationship with you and with your creative communities um, and with the people who are a part of your lives who are undergoing um, uh, so much um, disruption um, and, and uh, tragedy at this point in time. Um, I'm just saying this off the top of my head, these aren't prepared words, but they come from my heart. Um, and I know they come from the hearts of, of everyone who, uh, who is a part of this community, who is eager to, to be your supporters and, and to listen to the words that you're sharing that are your own and the words of the people around you and the experiences of the world um, that you are bearing witness to in a way that is so very important at moments like this. Um, so thank you for your generosity in joining us today. Um, thank you for being willing to be a part of, of this experience with us. Um, and please know that we're, we're here uh, to continue the conversation and uh, our thoughts are with you, uh, with your families, with your loved ones, with, with the members of your various communities. And we'll look forward to having opportunities to share more in the future. So um, please, everyone, uh, if there's a way for you to virtually share your enthusiasm and your and uh, your appreciation for today's event, please do so. And that brings us uh, to a conclusion then for today. Um, and thanks again to our audience members uh, uh, for joining us. Have a nice day, everyone.